All right, we're now at lesson 23, which takes us to the second to the last chapter, chapter 21. And this is where God's new heaven and earth is revealed. And what a glorious, glorious revelation that is. So let's read Revelation 21 and verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. What a glorious introduction. So let's break this down. Verse 1. Then I, then I saw, that being John, John saw a new heaven and a new earth. Well, where's the old one? Well, the, the, for the first heaven and the first earth, they've passed away. And the sea was no more. Now, this is something that... Um, the prophets, the teachers, uh, uh, the disciples, the apostles have been looking forward to for years and years. Uh, here's prophecy as foretold by the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I, that being Yahweh, create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. What a powerful, powerful prophecy. Uh, the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3.12 says, Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which, what? The heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells now john says also here the sea is no more well what does that mean well to be honest we are not sure uh, it just cannot be determined if this is literal in other words the oceans are gone if it's figurative such as the sea of gentiles uh, but that's probably not the case because uh, the remainder of Revelation 21 and the next chapter 22 talks about the nations. Um, so that's probably not the case. Or the third possibility is the sea of glass. Remember the sea of glass that was as big as an ocean before the throne of God. And the sea of glass also seemed to act as a barrier between what was happening down below on earth versus up above in the heavenly throne room. So uh, if you're going to ask me, I lean towards the latter, the sea of glass. Um, but uh, you're going you're gonna to read commentaries that have all three as uh, strong possibilities. So let's move on. Verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Powerful, powerful words here. 
um, the the writer of Hebrews, um, he talked about this where he says in Hebrews eleven ten, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God, is God himself. He goes on chapter 12, verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. In the next chapter, verse 14, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come which John here refers to as the holy city, New Jerusalem. But the exciting part in all this is this city coming down from heaven from God is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, let's put this in the context of Hebrew marriages. In the in context of Hebrew marriages, what, they're... Uh, there is negotiation, a betrothal um, with the father of the bride. And then after, bro- after the, the betrothal, the groom goes off to what? To prepare a new home for his bride. And then at the appointed time, what? He returns for the wedding ceremony, for the exchange of vows. And, and then there's the wedding feast. And what? He takes his bride to her new home. Have we heard something like that before? Yes, from the Savior himself. In John 14, 2, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself, may I add, as a bride adorned for her husband, that where I am, you may be also. An amazing promise by our Lord Jesus Christ. So also prepares a bride adorned for her husband. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah spoke about this many times. Isaiah 52, 1, where he says, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean because you will be holy. The city will be holy. In chapter 61, verse 10, he says, I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh, the Lord. My soul shall exalt. Remember, exalt is is like rejoicing on steroids in my God. For he has what? He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And then he goes on, the first verse of the very next chapter, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until... Her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation. And the word Hebrew word for salvation here is none other than her Yeshua. And her Yeshua as a burning torch. The nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. Well, what does the bride always inherit? She inherits a new name, the name from her husband. You shall be, verse 3, a crown of beauty in the hand of Yahweh and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate but you shall be called 
My delight is in her. My delight coming from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeshua, the Messiah, my delight is in her and your land, Israel, married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall. Your God rejoice over you. Do you hear what this is saying? The promise is as Jesus Christ rejoices over us, so shall our God rejoice over us. Let's read on. Verse 3, because it just keeps on getting better and better. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He, God, will dwell with them, and they, his people, his bride, will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Beloved, we have, we have read this over and over and over Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament promise, prophets, the, the, the promises that God was giving to his people. Remember Exodus 6-7 in, in Egypt where God says, I will take you. That word take you is leka, which is uh, as a man takes a woman to be his bride. I will take you, leka, to be my people. And I will be your God. And, and you see examples here in Exodus, Leviticus, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Zechariah, Zechariah 2.11. I want to read that one because that's so very special. And many nations, that's the Gentiles, shall join themselves to the Lord, to Yahweh in that day and shall be my people, says the Lord God, and I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. Wow. And who's the me? The Messiah. Awesome, awesome promises. Uh, hopefully you're seeing now how the Old Testament just comes alive with all these promises of God that are in time, that are eschatological. Uh, and it's just repeated over and over and over again. Blessings for those that follow God. Curses for those that turn their back on God. This is a common theme throughout Old Testament. This is a common theme throughout the book of Revelation. In verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more and neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. It's done. It's finished. It's history. As prophesied by Isaiah in 25 verse 8, he will swallow up death forever and the Lord God Elohim Adonai in Hebrew here will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for Yahweh has spoken. And then remember in Revelation chapter uh, 7 with the, with the multitudes that were before the throne of God taken out of the the great tribulation where it says, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, is this something that's gonna, God's gonna have to continuously do? No, no. This is more like a figure of speech that, that it is done, it is finished, 
what has resulted here now is the equivalent of God wiping away every tear from our eyes. Why? For the former things have passed away. And let me just throw this thought out. How could we ever appreciate no pain? Now stop and think about it. God could have created us never suffering any pain or death or, or colds or, or whatever. But how could we ever appreciate that? How could we ever appreciate no pain, no death, no suffering unless we've experienced it in our former life? Something to think on. Verse 5. Now, this starts the next section in chapter 21. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write these down, for the words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his guide and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay, so we have a lot to unpack here, so let's, let's get with it. Uh, first of all, verse 5. He who is sitting on the throne said, Whoa! This is the second time we're hearing directly from God in the book of Revelation. And when was the first time? Chapter 1, verse 8, which in one sense was reiterated uh, what he says here. Uh, because he says here, it, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Um, what he did not say in chapter 1 was what? The obvious. It is done. There he says, I'm the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. God is proclaiming himself as sovereign. He begins everything. He ends everything. Why? Because he's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. There is no one above our God in any capacity. He's the beginning and the end. And... God is the end fulfillment of all prophecy. So where he says here in verse 5, it is done, it is done. And then he goes on in verse 6, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Now the spring of the water of life, this represents eternal life. This is what salvation is all about. And this had been prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. Um, Isaiah 12, 3, with joy you will draw from the wells of Yeshua, the wells of salvation. That spring water, the well water of eternal life. Psalms 36, 8, they feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you, with you, Lord, is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. And from the prophet Zechariah, he says, On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem. And then listen to this. Half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as it is in winter. So the sea shall be no more. This is one good reason why I lean to uh, the uh, theory that it's the sea of glass before the throne of God. John 4, from Jesus himself, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, the Messiah, you would have asked him. And what? He would have given you 
living water. He said in chapter 7, verse 38, whoever believes in me, the Messiah, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And all of this is without payment. Now, why is that? Because this is so invaluable, so precious, uh, so expensive, it cannot be bought at any price with any works. There's only one way, and that is accepting Jesus Christ and his free gift. Uh, this was even prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Let's read on because this is so important. Verse seven, the one who conquers, who? The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. The one who conquers, the one who overcomes, to him who overcomes, the overcomer. Um, and that had been explained to us earlier in Revelation 12 verse 11, uh, because what? The conquerors here, they conquered him, what? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. This is so important. This has been repeated time and time and time again in Revelation. The overcomers, they overcome, they conquer by refusing to compromise their faith, even if it costs them their lives. Okay? We should never, ever compromise on our faith. Well, there's a lot of social pressures out there. Who cares? Well, there might be a time when things really get serious. Who cares? This is what's so important is, is to already to be mentally processed that if these challenges come, to be ready and prepared and to stand up for our Lord Jesus Christ, even if it's, it takes our physical lives away from us. And as I've said, for me, I, I, I choose to obey God rather than man. So um, the one who conquers is so important. And who's the opposite of the one who conquers? Well, that would be the cowards, which we're going to read in the very next verse. But before that, there's another important theme. As I said, the one who conquers will have this heritage. This had been hammered into us, hammered into the churches, okay? We'll have this heritage, this inheritance, this future, okay? And if you recall, in all seven letters to the church, to all seven, there was this phrase, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in paradise of God. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone. That's how individual um, our salvation is, that no one knows except the one who receives us. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end. Very also, very much great importance here. To him, I will give authority over the nations. Uh, to the one who conquers will be clothed thus in what? White garments. And I will never, I will never blot his name out of the books of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out from it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. To the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat down with my father 
on his throne. How important is it to, for us to be conquerors, to be overcomers, to stand up from our faith? He who has a hear, ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. That's my answer. So, now this all gets explained. Verse 8. So, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, or what? Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So, let's go through the list. The cowardly, okay? These are all deeds and practices that what? That lead to destruction and eternal damnation. A one-way trip, okay? The cowardly, those who fear their own life and persecution more than they fear God. Another way of saying this is unbelievers. Uh, and remember what we just read in Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in the prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. You know, beloved, we all die someday with minor exception those that are raptured so what's the big deal we're just passing through the big deal is our eternal life our eternal destiny revelation 12 verse 11 they conquered him by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death it bears being repeated now what about the faithless that's the second this comes from the greek word Apistos, without faith, unfaithful, without trust, unbelieving, or an unbeliever. The Greek word is kind of related to apostasy. It includes those that are unwilling to keep their faith when tested. Okay? Let that sink in. There's a lot of people in the church that right now are faithless. Psalms 119, 158 says, I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. You want to prove your faith? Prove it by obedience. Prove it by standing up to your faith that will be the fruits that shows everyone that you are a believer now what about the detestable the detestable detestable are those who are an abomination and are discussing before the lord and this word i think is only used twice in the new testament but in the septuagint which is the greek translation of the old testament it's all over the place and it's almost exclusively translated as abomination. So to help us understand what this word means, we need to look into the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 17, verse 1, You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep in which is a blemish, any defect, whatever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. We are supposed to give him our best, not our leftovers. Proverbs 15, 9, and the way of the wicked is what? An abomination to the Lord, Yahweh. But he loves him who what? Who pursues righteousness. That's a very important uh, uh, combination of words. It's not we're sinless, we're totally righteous, but we're pursuing it. We're seeking it. Uh, Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. That is an abomination. Deuteronomy 22, a woman should not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to Yahweh your God. And Deuteronomy 23.18, you shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or wages of a dog 
into the house of the Lord your God in payment for any vow, for both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. Or another way of phrasing this is that dishonest gain is an abomination to our Lord. Okay, what about the murderers, the sexually immoral? Uh, the murderers, well, the, uh, there's the obvious, right? Those that take away life, premeditated murder. But there's more to it. Remember uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ says, uh, uh, you know, if you're, ang- if, if you're angry, if you hate your brother, you know, um, you've already committed murder. You need to go and be reconciled. What does John say? 1 John three fourteen. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love, we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Okay, can you clarify that? Yes, verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And, well, what do you mean by that? And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. It's that serious. It's that serious. This is the reason why forgiveness is so vitally important. And forgiveness has nothing to do with who's right and who's wrong. It has everything to do with who is judge. And our command to love our neighbor as ourselves which was even upgraded in uh, John 13, 34. Jesus says, love as I have loved you. Now, what about the sexually immoral? Well, that's pretty obvious, uh, especially obvious if we go to the Greek, because the Greek word is pornos, a fornicator, indulging in unlawful sexual intercourse, prostitute. Um, And then we'll quickly go through some examples. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the adulterers, take note, nor men who practice homosexuality. Ephesians 5, 5, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. These are not the words of man. These are coming from God. 1 Timothy 1, 10, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, Wow, we've got a lot of perjury out there today. And whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Hebrews 13, 4, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, what about the sorcerers and idolaters and liars? The sorcerers? We have dealt with this before. Uh, The Greek word is uh, pharmakos, uh, and it comes from the root Greek word pharmakon, a drug. And so it's in in at least uh, the old world perspective, it was devoted to magical arts, a magician in today's society. It would definitely include the use of recreational drugs, pharmacies, pharmakos, idolaters, Well, we just read about that because that was defined by the Apostle Paul. I'll read it again, Ephesians 5, 5, because now we're going to look at it a little different. No immoral, impure, or greedy person. So no immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a person is an idolater. And such a person does not have any inheritance in the kingdom of God of Christ and of God. These are all this these are so vitally important that people know and understand and all liars besides the obvious includes what? Something that we've mentioned earlier. 1 John 2 4 whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. 
and the truth is not in him. John goes on to say in 1 John 4, 20, if anyone says, I love God, there's a lot of people out there who says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. These are so important to know and understand. Why? Because their portion, their place in the NIV translation, all that means is they are still existing. They have not been annihilated. All right? In the words of Jesus Christ, Matthew 7, 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And the sad thing today, especially in the United States, how many American churches or Western churches are preaching this? How many are saying, if, if, if you're doing these things, you are proven to yourself and to the world and to God that you're not a Christian. You do not take this salvation thing seriously. You are not accepting what Jesus Christ has freely given to you. We could go on and on and on, but I, we just don't have the time. But this is how important it is. And this should be a litmus test for every church out there, for every pastor out there. Okay, so it's so important, okay, to repent from such deeds. If you find yourself in, entangled and snared, you've got to repent. You need to be an overcomer. You need to be victorious in Ephesians 5, 3. But among you, there must not be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this, you can be sure. And listen to this. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater. That's what we noted the definition, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Oh, that's okay. Don't worry. Uh, for, because, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. So if you find yourself stumbling and falling, what does Jesus say? Pick yourself back up. What does the Bible say? Repent. Therefore, do not be partners with them. And the important, important, important verse in all of this is 1 John 1, verse 8 and, 1 and 9, which basically says, If we claim to be without sin, huh, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us uh, and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. That's how important this is. So let's read on. Verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, John, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit, notice that's capital S, to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from Heaven, from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east gate, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and 
the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to kind of blaze through this kind of fast, but this is also so very, very important. He carried me away in the Spirit. Notice the capital S. So once again, John is taken away by the Holy Spirit. So he is in a visionary state. So what he's seeing is in this vision. And he's taken up to a great high mountain. So it's not a high mountain on the old earth. Remember, that is all gone away now. It's not earthly, but it's a spiritual vantage point. We've read about this before in the Bible, Ezekiel 42, 40 verse 2, where it says, In the visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel, and he set me on a very high mountain, on which was a structure like a city to the south. Hmm, I wonder what he was shown there. Matthew 4, 8, where again, the devil took him, Jesus, during his 40 days of fasting and temptation to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. But in this case, I will show you what? The bride, the wife of the lamb. Who is the bride? Who is the wife of the lamb? Well, it tells us right there. It is, quote, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Okay, remember, we've already read it earlier, but it's, we need to read it again. What Jesus Christ himself said, in my father's house are many rooms. If we're not so, I would not have told you that. I, that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I, the groom, will come again and take you, the bride, to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I mean, this is just, it's massive, this promise. Verse 10, he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from the heaven of God, having the glory of God. It's radiance, like the a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. Well, jasper, uh, you can see the Greek word there, uh, iespis, is, um, it's a precious stone. Now, let me just put this up front. When we start looking at gemstones from ancient Greek and from ancient Hebrew and try to, to map those to what we know today, uh, in our perspective, in our language, it all, it's, it's a very, very difficult exercise, okay? because uh, precious rare stones were just that. But in this case, Iespus, uh, the Greek word, uh, what the Greek scholars say, it's a precious stone and it's of diverse colors. For some are purple, for others it's blue, for others green and others the color of brass. Well, I would almost say that's Alexanderite, not Jasper, but anyway, that's beside the point. You get the point of what it is and that this radiance is doing what? It's reflecting the glory of God. Verse 12, it had a high, great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes and the sons of Israel were inscribed. And on the east three, north three, south three, and west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were 12 names of 12 apostles of the Lamb. So do we see a pattern here? Yeah, the number 12. And what does, we see 12 gates, angels, tribes, foundations, names, apostles. 12 is what? It's a number of completion, perfection. It's done, it is finished. And on the, gate, on the gates and the names of the 12 tribes, the son of Israel, that would be representative of what? The Jewish people, the Jewish nation, Israel. Uh, for those that think the church has fully taken the place of, um, of Israel and the Jewish people, well, I guess they've never read Revelation chapter 21 because this is very clear. But there's 12 foundations on them with what? The 12 names of the 12 apostles. 
of the Lamb. That would represent the inclusion of the Gentiles into the church. Remember, this fulfills the mystery of God's will that we read in, in so many places. But Ephesians 1, 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. Remember, that was at the sound of the seventh trumpet. According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, for the fullness of time. That's what we're reading about here. To unite all things in heaven and on earth. But now in Christ Jesus, you, that's pointing to the Gentiles who were who once were far off, have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our priest, who has made us, us being both Jew and Gentile, one that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, Jew and Gentile, and might reconcile us, Jew and Gentile, both to God in one body through the cross. Now, does this mean that uh, there's no more Jews, there's no more Gentile, there's no more ethnic diversity? No, that's not what it says at all. Uh, but we will discuss that and explain that in part two of this video.